exhausted. <laughs> I've been sitting up and breathing all day. <laughs> Now, what is it you want? <laughs> okay. This is what I want. And I'm going to ask some questions in between. But to have fun, it's late at night. We're going to do a Q&A. How does oh, that sound? Oh, good. Okay. So let's go. Who is brave enough? Who's got the first question? I do. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like a hooker that was outside. <laughs> you got to speak into a microphone, though. Let's go. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Mr. Lewis, i got to ask you. Eliana just mentioned you were nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. Right. Okay, who did you lose to? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. I think... The Three Stooges. <laughs> okay. Yeah, one to your right. Mr. Lewis. Yes. My wife and I are here celebrating our 55th wedding anniversary. Well, and she, she'd that. like to have your autograph. Yeah, we'll take her to the room and leave us alone. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it. Okay. Who's next? I just want to give a shout out. I'm from North New Jersey and to our favorite dark son. Hello and have a wonderful cruise. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Lewis. Hello. Hi. I don't want to ask you a question. I just want to tell you that we love you and thank whoa, you so whoa, much. Whoa, 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 whoa. I haven't heard a goddamn word you said so <laughs> Slow it down. I'm sorry. This is your moment in the sun. <laughs> Take your time. Go ahead. Mr. Lewis, I, I lost my dad in 2011. And we loved you. I just want to tell you that we love you. That's all. He loves you. We love you. Thank you so much for everything you've done. Is he gay? <laughs> <laughs> this is my wife. She loves you too. I can assure you he is not. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, lady. <laughs> okay. Now, what, what do you think when people do impressions of you? What do you What do you think? I just say, get a job, <laughs> get some get some work, and practice a lot. <laughs> All right, who's next? Right over here, you right. Good evening, Mr. Lewis. I don't have a question. I have a comment. You want, you, want, a career? You, want, you want me to give you one? No. <laughs> Two minutes. As a career firefighter, I just wanted to thank you for all of your years doing the NBA Telethon. Uh, it meant so much to all of us. Thank you. My wife and I were privileged to see you on Broadway doing Damn Yankees, and you even put on a fire helmet playing the devil. That was perfect. Well, thank you for coming. You filled about six minutes for me. <laughs> Right over here in the back. Hi, Mr. Lewis. I'm Debbie Edge from Atlanta, Georgia. I grew up looking at all of your movies and the marathon, and I love you dearly. And I have a question to ask you. What is the favorite movie that you've done of all of your films? Huh? <laughs> what is the what? What is your favorite film? My favorite film... Peter Laurie's M. <laughs> <laughs> what about the movies that you directed? Oh, well, all of them. <laughs> the films that I directed were, were love affairs that I had with emotion. And the love affair that you had with your work is an extraordinary, unbelievable experience that you go through doing it. And it's very hard. I, I, I become offended when someone wants me to name that film and ignore that film. And I have, I have a very, very strong emotional... Uh, don't do that, Jerry, is what I hear in my head. Don't pick one and forget the others. And I live by that. And I trust it. 
I trust the feeling that I have. And if people come here and sit and, and wave the banner and yell bravo, I must have done something right. <laughs> For you, we yeah. were we were in a film together. Uh, Max Rose. Has anyone seen Max Rose? That's you were, <laughs> and you were you gave such a wonderful performance in the in the film. It went to the Cannes Film Festival, and it, but it's a very serious role. Do you prefer sometimes doing drama over comedy? Well, sometimes you're doing comedy that becomes drama. You don't mean for it to come out that way, but that's what happens. Uh, the, 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 the thought of doing drama, if you're a comedian, is a fearful thought because you are hoping that the people that are watching it understand that while doing it is difficult. And if you get through that, it's a wonderful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> you were, I learned a lot from you on the set. Just so what? I learned a lot watching you on the set. Oh, thank you. One of the things, you know, uh, that Jerry always has an open set, so anybody can come in and watch. And this is something you had back at Paramount. Yep. As many years as I've been in the picture business, I have had bleachers on the set where all the people that wanted to watch us make the movie were welcome. And the sign on the set was, this is not a closed set. Please come in and enjoy yourself. Yes. That was true. That was true. Okay, who's next? I think I lost the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lewis, Mr. Lewis, thank you for joining the cruise and thank you for making us laugh all these years. I'd like to ask you, who was the true inspiration for Buddy Love? The inspiration for Buddy Love? I would have to say every nasty bastard that ever lived. <laughs> <laughs> but that was what I had in the back of my mind when I did when I had a new buddy love, it was difficult for me, and I moved it in the schedule from shooting the buddy love sequence on the 40th day versus shooting the buddy love sequence on the 65th day. And I was right. I was more comfortable doing, doing the sympathetic character rather than the nasty bastard. And I enjoyed the differential, and I enjoyed having to change the tone, the tonality of the movie by the mere fact that you've got a different character on the screen. It's hard work, but it's worth it. We have a question here? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I don't have a question, Jerry. Well, then sit down. <laughs> you haven't changed a bit in all these years. <laughs> I was I was at the the Palace Theater the night you gave your final show there for for that time. Edie Gourmet was with you. Yeah. And I was sitting in one of the chairs over the balcony. And you kept teasing me and telling me things just like that. And then all of a sudden, you called behind the curtain and you said, bring me a ladder. They brought you a ladder and you practically got in my lap and you said, will you marry me? <laughs> I've heard that all my life and I just love it. Every time I tell somebody about it, but it's been a long time. You want, and, to, you want to pick it up somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> and I've seen practically all your movies, and one of my favorites is The Delicate Delinquent. Was what? The Delicate Delinquent. Oh, you saw that? Oh. 
You were the one, huh? <laughs> well, I had a great, great joy out of doing that film. My first joy was writing it. The second joy was putting it on its feet. And the third joy was seeing how lucky I can get with the balance of the film. And I had the good fortune of being one of those performers who loved everything I did. I never did anything that I disliked because I did not dislike the audience. I loved my audiences and I wouldn't give them less than the best. Hi, uh, Mr. Lewis, I'm a fan of the Martin and Lewis radio show from the late 40s and early 50s. And I was wondering what your thoughts are about the medium of radio comedy, some of the strengths and some of the challenges, and just your general thoughts. Thank you. And you want to spend six or seven hours tonight, is that it? <laughs> the, yes. the beauty of radio was that we were doing something that's never been done before. And we were experiencing getting laughter from projecting the sound of the voice and getting it some character. That was fun. When you couldn't give the voice character, you were in trouble. And you had to find a way to get yourself out of it. Because there's nothing worse than standing before an audience and having them yell, Get off! That's very dangerous. So you try desperately to get it to work and to get it to work right. When you have an audience seated in an audience facing you and they are, that audience is, is literally setting the tone for the comedian. When that happens, you can go any way you want and not get in terrible trouble. It's all very basic. And when we come to an evening like tonight where people are curious about how you spent your time in this business, it's a, it's a marvelous thing to feel, my God, I've done well. about you, you know, and I've seen you on live television, you were on the Dick Cabot was telling me you were on the Ed Sullivan show, you were hitting the camera, and you, did you ever feel you went too far cutting someone's tie off, or just being completely crazy, did you ever think, well, I went too far tonight? No, when I went too far, I didn't do anything. <laughs> An audience expects the craziness of the comedian to come out at some point during that performance. Yes. If it doesn't come out, the audience really feels crossed. They really feel like there was more for them to get and they didn't get it. And that comes across the footlights to the performer and he feels that right away. And then he knows, I better fix that. And it's a constant repair of what you do, even though you got the laughs last night and the night before. That's a wonderful feeling, but there's nothing quite like the feeling of getting it a second time and a third time. Yes. Who's next? Tila. Tila, come here. Hello. First of all, uh, Eliana, I'd like to ask you where you got your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> She wants to know where I bought my shoes. Oh, they're beautiful. Thank you. Manette <laughs> Lepore, French. Great. What's beautiful? She wants to know where I bought my shoes. Aren't they sexy? Your shoes are yes. mine. She thinks my <laughs> shoes are sexy. They yes. certainly are. I yes. Know. I'd are. like to play with them for a while. Well. <laughs> <laughs> hey, next, Mr. Lewis, I'd like to mention to you that I am a nurse. I'm from Louisiana. I'm here with my three best friends, well, two best friends, all the three of us are together. And I want to thank you for all the years that you have dedicated to the NBA. 
Uh, and I'd like to, for everyone to give you a, a great round of applause for that. Uh, Thank you very, very much. I appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that an audience comes into a theater, they sit down and they say, show me. Show me. Yeah. That's nice that they come into a theater and they say, show me. Then I have to find something to show them. Well, I tell you one thing, I know what you could show us, well, is that here we have a bet from Louisiana. And I had to pay for this trip for all three of us to come here. And one of my girlfriends here, just to see you now, and one of my girlfriends here, we have a bet that how about a kiss from Jerry Lewis? Is that good for she said? <laughs> how about just on the cheek? Barry, one of the girls <laughs> wants a kiss from Jerry Lewis. There you go. She wants a kiss? From Jerry Lewis. I have to tell her I don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> Sit in the back of the car, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next? Hello, I'm Deborah. I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. I've heard a story, and I need you to confirm. You supposedly were on a train in Paris. And some man got his hand stuck in a toilet. This is true. <laughs> Tell me. You were on a train, and she's saying you were on a train in Paris. Right. A man got his hand stuck in the toilet. Right. <laughs> a man was in the bathroom on a speed train. And you gotta do stuff fast on a speed train. <laughs> And he dropped his wallet in the toilet. He proceeded to try to get it out, and his arm got stuck in the unit. And then all of a sudden, in this nice station, it was Pierre Paris. This nice station became... It looked like the last four hours of Exodus. That's the <laughs> And, and people wanted to know, what do we do? I said, we save the man's arm. We save his life. We do what we have to do. And they were all looking at this comedian they'd grown up with, who was telling them what to do about getting the man out of the toilet. <laughs> we got him out, and he was very grateful. He wanted to shake my hand. <laughs> I'm uh, in Hollywood, and I'm a comedic performer. You're a what? I'm a comedic performer. <laughs> Are you asking me or telling me? <laughs> Still trying to figure that out. <laughs> okay. I, I was wondering, because it seems like you're always, in this business, you're always like looking for the next rung of the ladder to figure out where to go next. And I was wondering, what kind of guiding principle did you use to figure out what to do next as a performer to work your way in the industry? Well, I know that this will sound like, uh, it'll sound like uh, a reaffirmation of why I do what I do and so on, but when you're on that stage in front of an audience, the first thing you have to remember is your responsibility is to entertain that group of people. And you do that in the best possible way you know how. 
you, your job is to entertain the people. And if you bypass that, or if you ignore that, then you're a whore. <laughs> then you don't deserve facing an audience. And that has found, that has found its way into criticisms over the years of comics that didn't remember that they were there for a reason. Not only to earn a few bucks for themselves, but to clarify their purpose in life was to entertain. They're not gonna get a guy off the street and say, go out and do 20 minutes. Although I'd like to see him. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the, the important thing is if you do forget what your responsibility is, you will get in all kinds of trouble because there are, there are situations that you must touch upon to be successful. One is to enjoy what you're doing. Two, do it again. And three, hope it works a third time. Beautiful.